Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, but the URL is really difficult, so just go to YouTube and search for Virtual Memories Show. Now you can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Now, a few episodes ago, I, I posted from Seattle, uh, where Amy and I were on vacation. Uh, we had an old friend's wedding up in Orcas Island, which was just beautiful. Uh, then spent a couple of days in Seattle over July 4th weekend. And I, um, I think back on it fondly, uh, even though all we did was go to some nice restaurants with my pal Finkelstein and otherwise just lounge in the hotel room and watch Masters of, uh, Master of None on Netflix. Um, I look back fondly because I'm doing a lot of travel that I'm not that into, frankly. Uh, so it was nice to be at a place where they're just, well, where I was on vacation even though I brought my mics with me and recorded a couple of episodes, one of which you're listening to. Because going into the trip, as is my wont, I asked around for some guest suggestions, and the great Seattle-based cartoonist Jim Woodring suggested I get in touch with Ellen Forney, who is comics royalty in Seattle. He also kind of impishly suggested that I talk to Charles Kraft, the ceramics artist and neo-Nazi, but I, I, I passed on that one. Uh, Jim's a funny man. Uh, Ellen's one of the, the cartoonists who I've always heard great stuff about, and I only know her work sort of at a distance. Like, I'd read her strips, but never really read her in depth. Um, and I don't know why. It's just one of those artists I never quite got around to. So once Jim suggested her, I started reading up and realized, oh, my God, she'd be great. Um, so I reached out. She said, yes, we have an episode. It's awesome. Um the big work she's got, or the big thing you should check out, is a graphic memoir called Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me. Um, and it's about her bipolar condition. It's um, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, and just reading it before the trip really opened up a lot of um, things we could talk about. So we got together on a Sunday afternoon to record after the the trip back from Orcas Island, which was a story in itself and and one that I won't bore you with. Although, um, speaking of boring, there is a giant gap in the middle of this episode where I sort of digressed into talking about my day job. Um, it ties into Ellen's memoir because it's about drugs and generics and um, and all that stuff. But um, I don't leave the whole gap in, but it's um, there's no way to patch the two parts together. So I will tell you where we cut that part out. Um, anyway, on with the show. Here's Ellen's bio. Cartoonist Ellen Forney is the author of New York Times bestseller Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me, and the 2012 winner of the Genius Award in Literature from Seattle's The Stranger. She collaborated with Sherman Alexie on the National Book Award winning novel The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, created the Eisner-nominated comic books I Love Led Zeppelin and Monkey Food, those are two separate books, by the way. It's not I Love Led Zeppelin and Monkey Food, which on the face of it would actually be a really awesome title. Anyway, she's also taught comics at Cornish College of the Arts since 2002. She grew up in Philadelphia and has lived in Seattle, Washington since 1989. Ellen swims and does yoga and fixes things with rubber bands and paper clips. 
She also has an enormous, this isn't part of the bio, but I have to tell you because it's part of the show. Uh, she also has this enormous back tattoo designed by the great cartoonist Kaz, who I recorded with a couple of years ago. Um, it's something that comes up at the very beginning of Marbles and at the very end of this conversation. And that's why I'm telling you. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Ellen Forney in which we are already talking about the protean style of Bob Sikoriak when we start. Well, it's fun. It's fun to work in other styles that you, that you, I, I did a, I did a comic, um, Lust is the collection. It's, yeah. it's, um, I did a comic, a weekly comic for years called Lust Lab out of the week. And um, I would take one of the kinky personal ads in The Stranger yeah. here and, um, and just adapt it into a one-panel comic, cartoon. cartoon. And, and because, I, because every week it was different, I, I, just, I could just play. And so, you know, sometimes the lettering, what did I do? Like lettering, like a, like a kind of psychedelic 60s rock poster, you know, like those mm -hmm. kinds of lettering and... Uh, weird, creepy, abstract photography and uh, Picasso and um, Frida Kahlo, and I, I could, ju I just sort of, and mishmashes of those, and and like wacky packs, kind of, you know, products with the different, and it was, it was really, it was, it, it was really different to, to, I mean, I don't know what Bob Sequoia acts process is like or what his inspiration is I mean everybody comes from a different angle but it was really fun to take something that was really quite structured and like something quite structured like Nancy or Popeye or um, you know like a, um, a package of peanut butter or you know like things that are very set and to um, make them your own enough of a, your own spin on it that mm -hmm. it's that it's yours and how much of that is a working out process for you, how much is you know you found the Ellen Forney style, and this is you know Ellen having exercises and and playing with different different models of art. How much of that do you still do at, at this point? Like like that process, yeah. That I was and and when you're working on cartoons, also talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to think when I was first starting out that I was using a lot of different styles, mm -hmm. and um, that they were really quite disparate. And that they didn't necessarily hang together, and that I needed to choose something. But um, but I've come to realize that they that they all hold together, um, even when I think I'm doing things that are really different. So that's why. So in in marbles, I use a lot of different drawing styles um, because I have learned that they that they hang together. They do actually make a, a package. I think a lot of it for me is that it's pretty much all done in brush, but I guess that's not even necessarily the case because I've done work in uh, in in pen. I I'm I guess it it feels of a piece to me, and I've come to trust more that it feels of a piece to readers, viewers. Mm -hmm. Um, from the very different things that I've done, like the light rail stations. Did you see? Yeah, the light I've seen rail the, the art. I didn't get to see because we, we were driving. Uh, we ended up turning off on a different um, street. But I uh -huh. will make sure to take mass transit so that I can see <laughs> your murals while I'm, I'm here. Um, so that's so it's so that's in brush, but it's blown up really big. That one mural that you may have gone by was 40 feet long, so it's bl blown up huge. The the lines. The, the line weight is, oh, I guess it gets to probably, I don't know, how much is it? Maybe not quite a foot, but... 18 you know, inches. Like, I'm just kidding. It's, it's a guy well, thing. Well, so. you know, it's... Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I feel terrible about that joke, uh, but I had to put it out there. So, um, so from that to, like, uh, drawing in pen in the Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Did mm -hmm. you? Are Sherman you Alexi, I've that? seen mm -hmm. uh, pieces of it, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, but, yeah. You know. I did a ton of work for that. And that mm -hmm. was, um, that I just used um, a, a pen, like a like a, a micron pen, because that was that was intended to look like it was a sketchbook or a diary, and it, it, had, it had to be, well, like a diary. Um, and so it had to look more spontaneous. That was actually harder for me to do than the 
brushwork that I usually do. You mean so it's a fake spontaneity? Yeah. Faking spontaneity, hmm. it was really hard. That was really hard. I, it's mm-hmm. one of the keys of my life. People actually fall for it all the time. They actually think I'm authentically... <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> how did the relationship with Alexi come about? Um, or how did well, that project come about? Yeah, he's a, he asked me. He's a comics fan. <laughs> um, and um, we had been introduced by a mutual friend. And he really liked my book, Monkey Food. The What is that? Monkey Food is the oh, it's the a complete collection. Seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, it's a collection of the um, weekly strip that I used to do. I was seven and seventy five, mm-hmm. and so um, so drawing from the point of view of a kid, you know, that was me growing up in the seventies, and so he um, he he emailed me that he had this idea for a book and would I be interested? And um, and you said work. Great. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I don't usually collaborate with mm-hmm. other people. I mean, I, it's rare for me to want to do that. Yeah. Even I really, um, the process of collaborating is, uh, it's an interesting one. And for me still, it feels almost more like an interesting exercise than it is really feeling like productive, um, the way that I would want okay. to, to, <laughs> It's not even the way that I how to my like my comfort zone like like it feels yeah. like a complete package to me when I am doing the doing the writing and drawing because they're they're so intertwined for me I I talk about that so I I teach um, I teach you've got all of these topics I've actually written down but trust me we'll get to them all it's okay <laughs> but with Alexio let's focus yeah, on that okay, the, the act right, of collaboration right. was was um, so so while collaborating with someone. Uh, it, it's a, the reason I say it, it feels kind of like an exercise, like a good exercise is that it makes me stretch in directions that I wouldn't necessarily go. Mm-hmm. Um, one collaboration that I really enjoyed was with David Schmader, who is, um, a local writer. Um, and he and I did a series of full page comics for the stranger called what the drugs taught me. And he, um, so he, it was his writing about his history with recreational drugs and, and I turned them into comics and it was, it was really great. That was when we really got to know each other and when we really got to, to be friends. I mean, we were friends before then, but you know, working together like that, you really, you, and brainstorming with someone and back and forthing, you, you get to know them a lot better. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a in a very in a special kind of way that you only do when you're creating something and collaborating. Um, uh, so, so uh, basically, it makes me express things and draw things that I that I wouldn't otherwise, which is very concrete. The 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 more amorphous things that come. You, the more amorphous things that I that I learned from that are a little harder to to pinpoint, but um, but that but that's the main beneficial part for me working uh, with someone is um, well. I, I I take that back. There there are many different things that are that are awesome about collaborating. Yeah. Just just working with someone else that that is a, a, a creative that I respect. It's exciting, and it's ex- an exciting process to brainstorm. Um, and, and then that it does stretch me in different directions is uh, more of a bonus, maybe. Um, but, it really, but it really feels much more like a, a, a complete package to me, kind of, when I'm, when I'm working on my own work and... and um, and all the different aspects, all the different angles that go into it. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to the enormous line weight you had to do for these murals, mm-hmm. did you? Our our mutual connection is Jim Woodring, mm-hmm. uh, another Seattle cartooning legend, and I consider you well, at least cartooning <laughs> royalty, if that's good. <laughs> um, Jim's got the the six foot nib, mm-hmm. uh, that nibus maximus. Mm-hmm. Did you have to use any uh, you know tools you weren't accustomed to using in the process of making that stuff um, or making well, those murals? that's funny that you make that comparison. Um, uh, Jim Anytime just... I can bring up nibus maximus, I will. <laughs> I, I think it's just the most awesome thing. Cool. Well, 
Jim just had a show not long ago of his um, his yeah the pen drawings the, with that enormous the pen drawings with yeah. the and beautiful just beautiful and there was something um, and we and we talked about how how scale changes the meaning of a drawing and and how it's really there again it's really kind of hard to put your finger on what it is that for for him he was somehow able to make this enormous pen uh i couldn't wield an as enormous a brush as i would need in order to do those incredibly thick lines i mean it would take so much sable and i'm sure that the that the brush wouldn't actually have the the control the, or the the line or even just like the 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 um the structural physical makeup sure you know i mean i don't know i don't know you know like the you know the molecular makeup of the nib <laughs> when it's small as opposed to the nib when it's big i mean i'm sure you know jim knows up and down like how it is that they that they act differently I with he, the paper he was amazed and with to, the, to find out that it actually worked right comparably to a, a well, normal that size that it's not just a novelty. Yeah. You know? So, um, so for mine, for mine, I used a much bigger brush than I usually work with. Usually I work with, um, uh, number two or number three, um, sable brush. And for that, I worked with an eight, I think, which it, it's just, <laughs> it's this beautiful brushes, uh, it, but much thicker and then much bigger paper and it just it felt um i don't know maybe that doesn't maybe that doesn't sound like an, a huge difference but all you not, brush people out there <laughs> all you brush people i used an eight can you believe it an eight charles burns is laughing in the background <laughs> but did it feel like a new medium essentially no okay it just felt like scaling up something yeah. you were accustomed yeah. to yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah um one of the things that i really love about Pen and ink, although I, I'm, I don't, um, some other people's pen and ink, I've never really taken to it entirely. Um, and brush are the varied line widths. And so, um, the, the varied line widths and, and the kind of expressive line that a brush and a nib, um, creates. Um, it, it just, it has so much, it has so much life, um, and can suggest so much movement or energy or uh, has an organic quality that that is that is really um, um, full of meaning, I think, and just um, is so interesting to look at. So taking that and and blowing it up and exaggerating it, like like Jim did, like 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 I played with with the murals. Like I played with in this series that you can see on my walls, which we'll have pictures a, of in the show notes of the episode. Yeah. So this was a, actually this was a precursor to the to the murals mm -hmm. in the light rail station. So there are hands in different positions um, with the same. It's really thick black line work that um, is my signature line work. I guess <laughs> one of my one of my signature styles um, and uh, and fields. Uh, in the negative space is flat, hmm. bright red, kind of like a silk screen. Did you ever imagine you were going to have work on public display at that size? No, I had no idea. Were you terrified of having public work on display at that size? Terrified? Would terrified be the I? I, you know, I, I, that the so that so that public art is the only public art that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. It's the the it's by far the largest. Thing that I've ever done, both in the uh, scope of you know what what this what this is in Seattle and the light rail system is is uh, is I mean what public transportation means to Seattle is enormous, um, and then and then just on a on a um, my art yeah. yeah no what's the word I'm looking on literal on a, like oh. literally large <laughs> um, the the one that you passed by. 
maybe. Did you pass by it? Without did. looking. By it, yeah, right? I, I was too busy looking away from it, the guy who was driving. So, right. Yeah. It was 10 feet. That one is 10 feet tall and 40 feet wide. Mm -hmm. And the other one is 28 feet wide and 20 feet high. So it's, it's um, big. They're big. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I really had no idea how, how much that would change the expressiveness of it. The impact, yeah, but there's just, there's just something about the size. There's something about the size that also uh, means that it's context specific. Mm -hmm. um, you can't take it away with you. Like with a comic, you, you have it in your hands. There's something really intimate about it. Um, the way the way that something enormous, uh, let's say a piece of architecture or or my mural or or Jim or or Jim's big um, drawings in the fry, they're 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 just they're just I would say you a know, different a different I, medium, but not in terms of the medium it's composed with but the interaction with the uh the viewer does that sound okay i'm going i'm going to take i'm going to i'm i'm going to go ahead and do this i'm going to go ahead and take it to hyperbole awesome <laughs> so when something is because because i've i've been i especially when the light rail system just opened and the murals just went up i really questioned like why this was so impactful mm -hmm. and um and certainly the study of scale and why scale is 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 so impactful is is something um like in and of itself i haven't looked up those articles in those textbooks but there's something but there's something about um feeling small mm -hmm. there's something about feeling small next to something big like the ocean or or like with here, I'm going to keep going back to Jim. Uh, with the big pen, there's something um, kind of childlike about it, like with childlike, like we like we're you're looking dwarfed at something by big, something, yeah. right? You're yeah. dwarfed by something. There's something like you you you're kind of um, uh, re released from some kind of um, responsibility, maybe like like. Like you, you feel really, if you feel really small, um, in a, in a way that you don't feel unsafe, like you're again, like, like at the ocean or like in a forest or something like that, that or, or see here, this is where hy the hyperbole is coming in. Go, right? like, go, go. Like, uh, but, uh, um, like, uh, like the way that we can find comfort in thinking about certain universal qualities and, 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 and that, you know, if we feel really small with these things that are much larger than us, then things like not getting to your email quickly enough seems very, like really beside the point and really tiny. So that that is, I think, on like on the far end of of how it is that something large in scale is is comforting and impactful. But I think it's also it's also just um, it's easier to see. Um, like it's it's um, it's I mean that seems like an an obvious thing, but like if you think about a um, a, a soft noise and a loud noise. And how different they are, like a little chime versus like a big, big symbols. It just affects it affects your senses differently. Anyway, I mean, I, 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 I could go on about that, and probably I'll think of a million different ways that I think scale is really interesting. I mean, if you, if here I am going to go right on, <laughs> but if you think about, um, I'm, I'm a, like if you think about like like reading teeny tiny writing well okay i uh, my uh, i just got i just got derailed my brain just sort of like went off in a different direction i'm going to which could bring, bring us back, back to in. marbles yeah, but, yeah. but go on yeah, yeah. right yeah yeah <laughs> that's right what's it mean to be part of seattle in that respect to, to have your work as 
part of Seattle municipally when you've been part of Seattle for about 30 years now. Do you feel that that um, connection, contribution, is it 30 permanence? years now? 1989, been, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm jumping yeah. ahead of the game. Wait till I, I ask you what it's like to be looking at 50. Oh, God, yeah. Well, I am looking at 50. Yeah. Um, You're lucky I didn't start you off with that question because you would have just punched me and it would have ended things quick. <laughs> I'm just not good at math and I don't usually think about it that way. I just know at some point I, I, I passed the mark of, of having lived here longer than I'd lived anywhere, anywhere else, else and I just kind of left it at that. Yeah. <laughs> but being part of having your work as part of Seattle now, you know, having something that's, that's physically right. embedded in the city that you've made home. Right. How's, well, I feel, how's Seattle changed for you over? Oh, well, that's a that's a those are big questions. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. I'll I'll start with the first part of that, um, which is that I, I have. So I grew up in in Philadelphia. Um, my mom hates it when I say that because I was born in New Jersey, and, and there's nothing I, wrong with I, that. I, I keep there, telling people. No, no, yeah. I, I'm proud of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, and then I lived in Metuchen, New Jersey when I was, uh, when I was a young kid. And that's where, um, the, I was seven and 75 stories took place. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really consider Philadelphia my hometown. Um, and, 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 uh, unless you're talking about where I live now and I feel really, really at home in Seattle and you know, that's why I've lived here for so long. And, uh, it, is um, a major part of marbles, um, if you think that context is a major part of a story. Uh, there's there's Seattle all through it, and the different different places in in Seattle, and um, places that aren't there anymore. So um, so it's important to me, and I've lived in Capitol Hill. This is the the um, the part of town that that we are in right now. And the light rail station where I have the murals is just a couple blocks from here. So, and I, and, and I've lived in Capitol Hill pretty much the whole time that I've lived in Seattle. And so I feel really like kind of a Capitol Hill girl, if you will. A, uh, uh, and is that a stereotype of some kind? I, no, I, no, 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 okay, no, 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 we had just talked about my being 50, I'm, I'm almost 50, <laughs> yeah. uh, and if I can still call myself a girl or not. It's bad if I call you a girl, though, right? Um, uh, it depends on the context. <laughs> but so, but so to to be uh, to be a part of the landscape here is um, is really um, it's it's an honor, and it feels uh, it feels really it feels it feels really right to me. Mm -hmm. um, I I you know like I feel like I'm offering offering something to my neighborhood and my city and I've gotten enough positive feedback that I don't feel like I am imposing me yeah. <laughs> on my neighborhood and my city. So, um, so it's very, it's very, uh, it's very, it's very satisfying in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. The murals are on street level, so... Um, I'll look so... for them for Christ's sake. I will look <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, but it's very different from... Yeah, um, underground inside yeah, under, a metro station or something. Yeah. Because that that's more as a part of the as a part of the transportation system. You will but keep in mind also... you're, you're talking to a guy who I had a trade show in Brussels many years ago, mm -hmm. blew off dinner with my coworkers so that I could take the metro all the way out to some like far off suburban station because that's where the Herge murals mm -hmm. were. Some Herge painted the entire length of this one station in Tintin uh uh style and, and all these characters and I thought yeah, I could go out to a fancy dinner, or I could go see that, and uh -huh. that's why I have a really tough social life. But anyway, that's that's. Was yeah. that in paint? Did he use paint? Yeah, yeah I've got. A, I actually put it up on Flickr. There's a whole photo set I've done of of because I had to prove that I was actually there. Otherwise, they would think I was just blowing right. them off for no reason. Because right. Brussels. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these are um, they're porcelain, enamel, and steel. Mm -hmm. So they're um, they're kind of like the. Well, it is the surface of a stove. Yeah, you know the um, it's um, powder coated and goes in and out of the kiln a number of times. So um, that was really exciting to work in that medium yeah. too. Cool. How did you get started in comics? 
What were your influences in, in comics when you were a kid? My influences? Oh, when I was a kid? Yeah, what got you stuck? Like, what were the things you were reading when you were a little kid? And then what was the moment of, hey, I can make these? Well, I would say when I was a kid, well, just like everybody, I was a big, you know, I read The Funnies on Sundays. Uh, and uh, Peanuts. I was a big fan of Peanuts. And I would get books out of the library of Peanuts. But I didn't, I didn't really... I didn't, you know, I'm not sure what it was exactly that got me started doing the kind of work that I was doing in high school here and there. I know that I had gotten a hold of a, a, a fabulous furry Freak Brothers, Gil Sheldon, uh, Fat Jackson. Phil, I don't have I don't have a memory of going there. Oh, the the, the comic you store, know? Fat Jack's Comic yeah, Crypt. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Philadelphia comic store for those of you listening, blah, blah, blah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't really until college that I, that I found the comics that made me really want to consider going in that direction mm-hmm. of doing my own comics. And those were um, uh, Matt Groening's Life in Hell and Alison Bechtel's Dykes to Watch Out For. And I remember a Roz Chast collection. I don't remember what that would have been. Um, and actually another one, which uh, might seem unrelated, but isn't, is the Moosewood Cookbook. Are you familiar with I've the heard Moosewood the name, cookbook? but I'm blanking on what it is. It is, um, it is, it is a, a classic vegetarian cookbook from that would explain it so i don't i from (laughs) the eight early 80s i don't even know if it was as late as early 80s um and it is uh it's it's handwritten and illustrated and it uh, you know i i didn't think of this as one of my influences until years later when i was flipping through it and it just it was sort of oh, you know, that's like where all this came forehead. from. Yeah. Well, a lot of the work that I do is very informative. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of how to like informational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, ex- explanation: how to. I mean, there's a whole yeah, the there's whole a whole section of, of of how there's a whole chapter of how tos in my book. I love Led, Led Zeppelin, Zeppelin. Yeah. and um, and a whole lot in Marbles as mm-hmm. well. How to swallow your pills in one gulp. For example, like I, I really and and you know mapped out and um, I think that she, Molly Katzen is the the writer, um, the cook and writer of the Moosewood Cookbook, and she just she has little details in there like um, like um, like if one of the ingredients is wine, let's say in a sauce, at, at one point you know. You you know like you have to wait for something to to simmer for a while, and you, she suggests you know sitting down and pouring yourself a glass of that wine, you know like that yeah. kind of little detail that makes something as I guess almost clinical as a as a recipe that really makes you want to read it and makes it really human and makes it seem like you're in the same room maybe as the person who's writing yeah. the impact of of legible friendly writing um and the drawings that it, there was something just very generous about it anyway uh, i i just figured that out not that just a few years ago um that that was a big influence on me so Hence my going on about it, I suppose. <laughs> it's good to be excited about um, stuff. It's, but then... Uh, we're old and decrepit now, like I, I said. I would say um, later than that, once I was thinking about... When I was really exploring if I if I wanted to do comics professionally or not, the, the other big influence on me was Michael Dugan, um, a Seattle cartoonist that... I always wonder what happened to him. You know... Um, I think I, th- I I don't know. I yeah. never. Everyone has the same thing. They all yeah. have a yeah. I love the the East Texas stuff mm-hmm. and the, the other books. And he just yeah. East Texas, I I got at Fat Jacks too. And the uh, strip he drew for Denny Icorn, Dennis the Sullen Menace, is one of the greatest things I've ever read. And he just kind of. 
Um, or there's some great story that nobody wants to tell me about where he ended up. That's entirely possible too. But you know. if I if I if, find out, if when I show someone um, who is familiar with my work, but maybe not your lettering reminds reader, me of Michael's um, because I you know what that's where you I got didn't it from. I didn't mean to swipe yeah. anything from Alison Bechtel or swipe anything from Michael Dugan. But they, I, I was so influenced by their work. I was so steeped in their work that um, that's what came out of my fingers, really. And I, I hope that you know it's changed enough through time. Yeah. That no, it's only the older stuff and the big expressive uh, lettering bursts remind me of Dugan, which yeah. led to my developing the theory that Dugan may not have existed and you were actually the person uh, under a pen name, you know, being Michael Dugan. And then you went off and did your, <laughs> so, okay, you're, you're, well, you you're know, dashing that hope. But it was, yeah, it yeah. was, it was Michael who um, suggested that I use a brush. Mm -hmm. uh, and stop stealing my lettering. I'm oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not at that point. But my G's are a curl, like like his. I got that really quite specifically from him. If he said, "Hey, you swiped my G's," I would. Do, well, I, you I would, got like, me. I would shrug, you know. I yeah. and I I didn't do it in a calculated way, um, but I just feel like a terrible nerd that I still identify things like that. You know, that I still pick up on the oh yeah, this is you know reminiscent of that person's you know lettering of a particular, you know, weird little style. So again, I don't mean it in any, any, you know, implication or, or, you know, bizarre thing about your work. It's just how fucked up my life is that I still like pick up on little elements like that in comics that I hadn't read in 20 years. Um, which I guess is a good thing that they make an impression. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for that. That sounds good. Yeah. Tell me about teaching, teaching comics and what do you learn in the process of developing a curriculum to teach? Right. Um, well, Unless we still haven't figured out how you got started in comics, which we should probably also finish up. Oh, well, uh, how I started, I got started. Wait, how, like what aspect of how did I get started in comics? Like you, you mentioned not being sure if you wanted to professionally right. be a cartoonist. Yeah. Yeah. Have you figured that out? Well, I, so I had always drawn and, uh, told stories and so you could kind of say that I had been doing comics since I was little and I know that I did things that were really quite you know I had had all of the trappings of comics like word balloons and things yeah. like that when I was in high school not a ton not like not uh I I have never been as prolific as a lot of other dedicated cartoonists still I'm not super prolific I've come to terms with that but uh, I decided that I, I I really didn't want to go in. I didn't I didn't want art to be my profession, and I didn't want comics to be my profession. Um, I went to Wesleyan University. I didn't go to an art school, and I majored in psychology. And I thought that I was going to go into psychology, and. Um, which, in a sense, you did, but we'll get back to that topic also. Well, I looped back. Yeah. I mean, so that I mean, that's one of the things that was that was really uh, uh, of the many things that were, uh, you know, I, I, the word catharsis is so big and cathartic is is played out, uh, played up. But there were many things that really felt like um, like t tie, tying up loose ends or putting things in a box or, you know, like things falling into place, you know, like that, that sense, that sense of like, Oh, that's what that's about. Or that's why that happened. Or I get that now, like that kind of thing that my interest in psychology, um, and the way that people tick for a long time, I related that to comics, um, as, um, just really being interested in, in what makes people tick and the kind of stories that, that come about and the way that people develop and the, the reasons that we make certain decisions and just um, the way that people think, I think, is, is really interesting and I always have. Um, but, but then on a more obvious level, you know, coming, com doing that circle of coming back and doing a book about bipolar disorder, my bipolar disorder, um, my psychology, and doing a lot of research into 
psych studies. It felt very familiar. It felt it felt like uh, it just it it all made sense in a way. Like doing graduate work in yourself. Marbles to a very large degree was the senior thesis that I never did. At Wesleyan, there was not a required uh, thesis in Did you try to skate psychology, under the bar as best you could? Which was one of the several reasons that I majored in psychology, <laughs> but is also one of the reasons that I have very lengthy and detailed endnotes in, in mm-hmm. Marble's uh, I just for the fictional I, thesis advisor. Well, well, oh. I mean, so so it was really satisfying for me. I did a ton ton of research, and um, well, so one of the one of the many threads that went into marbles was the correlation of mood disorders and creativity. Mm-hmm. So I did um, I did a lot of research about that. Um, or as we laymen call it, the crazy artist syndrome. Well, well, right. And yeah. how much truth is there to that? I mean, we know that there are that there are plenty of myths and beliefs that don't hold water. And just because it's something that seems intuitive doesn't mean that it's yeah. true. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I still have criticisms of almost almost every study that I cite. Which I think is important, yeah. you know. Once you, once you, it, it it doesn't take looking into things very far to to ask questions that are hard to answer. How many how many people were studied yeah. for this? The metrics, this, of how qualitative you know, like, they are. They, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, they were all seniors at that one college, and were making generalizations about humanity. Really, yeah. you know. There were 20 people in that. When was that done? Where was that done? How, you know, like what was the, what could the bias have been? Were they really looking for anything or were they really looking to prove like a thing that they already thought was true? Anyway, like all, all, all of those things. I think it's a, it's a big uh, limitation in a, in, a, in a lot of, in a lot of studies. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things, one of the things that I, that was, one of the most important things that I learned in uh, college, I think, was in a psych stats class, um, statistics, which I just was terrible at. We were just talking about like math. I'm just yeah. like I get to I, I like I play artist. Just like math, math is beyond me. Uh, and but and it but it uh, yeah. just the, the statistics. I was just the, oh, it's just I was just the the oh, it was terrible at statistics. However, however, um, learning how easy it is to skew the results or all the different pitfalls that can come into play with, um, like we were just saying, you know, like the number of people in the study or where or when, um, the different ways that they can be contaminated in whatever way. It was really, really eye-opening and has remained so with with any numbers that are floated by. Four out of five dentists surveyed recommend, right? Like, who are those four out of five? Where did, let me see the study. When was that done? Who did you do? You know, like, who did you do to five of your friends? You know, and and for a, a lot, a lot of the statistics that are just thrown away, 20 percent, 5 percent. If you if you actually look in there at all, I mean, for one, things are a lot more complicated than they're usually boiled down to. It's important for things to be simple and succinct. I, I, I think you know, you know, uh, three about three percent of the population has bipolar disorder. About ten percent of the population has some sort of mood disorder. That's useful. That's useful. But then, but then it doesn't take very long to think. Okay, well, when you say bipolar disorder, what what do you even what do you mean? Like what? Bipolar one, bipolar two. Are you including cyclothymia? Are you including people that haven't been diagnosed, misdiagnosed? Do you mean just in the United States? Do you mean just adults? You know, like it, it kind of it goes on and on. Well, okay. Well, that's two percent. Well, that's twenty five percent. Well, that's you know like point oh five percent. This is a large population that we have no idea. 
that so they're useful um like statistics are useful obviously studies like well done studies i depend science i believe in science there i said it (laughs) um but then also recognizing the limitations uh is uh i i equally important i guess Mm -hmm. to not entirely make assumptions one of the major concerns we'll say for your character in in marbles Mm -hmm. just because it's a way of of framing the ellen of the book is that getting treatment for the bipolar condition you had would stunt you as an artist or cripple you artistically i would say the the disorder that i have yes right yeah that that's you know appropriate um what was the process in getting over that and do you feel that it it, how do you feel that it changed you as an artist getting treatment and finding a a treatment that actually worked or works as an ongoing thing right yeah (laughs) um well and was there a process of doing this book that also helped fix things or help repair some of what's what you're working through. Right. That's well, a terrible term to use. Repair isn't great. Um, you know, the ongoing maintenance, heal, I guess, is it. Um, stabilize. Yeah. Uh, um, well, f- for me, when, when I was first diagnosed, I was very manic and I didn't want to take medications and I had a lot of uh, fears, like you said, around how um, medication might um, make me not creative. I'm not an artist anymore. And what, what would that, what would that do? It was, uh, ter- terrifying. Yeah. But then when I, um, when I got depressed, when I fell into this low, low depression, which in, in my book, I, I, um, reproduce, uh, a drawing that I, that I did of what that felt like um, which was um, just sli- slipping feet first, kind of belly down, like kind of your fingers just raking through this mud, d- d- falling into this big muddy hole. Yeah, it was that was, it was horrible, and it was clear at that point that I just I needed I needed help. Mm-hmm. That you know, like all of that, all of my. All of my manic, I can take care of it myself. All of this, you know, like I, w- I want to, I want to be free to do what I want to do. As in, you know, like I don't need meds. You know, I, can, I can handle it. It just, it just all went out the window. It was really clear that I, I, I just, I wasn't going to be able to do it myself. Mm-hmm. I had a psychiatrist. She was the one that was holding out a lifeline, really, and so I, I didn't have a choice, really felt like I didn't have the choice if I was to survive. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's like to, to people who have been super low depressed, I mean, that's really, that's really what it feels like. And I knew a lot of people don't survive yeah. really. It's a, it's a really tremendously difficult, uh, disease depression for anybody who even has any sort of mood disorder, whether there's mania in it or not. Um, so, so at that point, right then it almost was beside the point what yeah. it was going to do to my creativity. You know, like the kind of the first off I, I had to live yeah. and, um, and then as it turned out, as I went along the, the meds that I was taking wasn't, they they weren't really messing with what I would consider the core of um, my creativity. Um, it was more I the mean, ancillary the, effects around it, at, right? At, well, right. I mean, the depression really took its toll, <laughs> yeah. you know, at the yeah. time. Um, but I I feel like I'm kind of I'm kind of lucky in in that regard in a way uh, in a few ways. Everybody's everybody's disorder is different, and everybody responds to different meds and different treatments. I mean, that's one of the reasons that there are so many out there. 
because they're... If you've they're, ever seen the, the print ad for Abilify, which you mentioned being on at one point in the book, uh, Bristol Myers actually put in the line, how we think Abilify works. Right. Because there's no mechanism right. that they can define no, no, as they to don't. what it's actually doing. Right. Yeah. I actually have never been on Abilify. It's oh. one of the ones in the back, uh, the page that I'm talking about, how expensive a disorder oh, okay. is. Oh, okay. I thought it was know? because it was part of your regimen yeah. at the no, time. No, oh, no, no. Um, and at that point, when uh, when Marbles came out, there was no generic for yeah. Abilify. So that makes a huge, huge difference. That's I part remember, of my day job. I, I negotiate with and against the generic drug industry. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It all ties together. It's, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so do you, do you try to keep the trademark on the... No. Uh, my guys... Hey, folks, here's the gap I mentioned earlier. I went on for like 15 to 20 minutes about generic drugs, healthcare lobbying, uh, really great stories and anecdotes from my, my day job. I cannot put any of those on tape. So um, it's a pity. You're not going to get to hear it. But if we're ever hanging out with no mics around, I will tell you some stories. So, But the so, process of making marbles, though, So, in terms of how it changed you. Hmm? The process of making this book, though, how did it change you? The process of making marbles? Yeah. Oh. Both telling the story, uh, you know, looking at yourself well, in that, that retrospect. For that well, you know, one, one, thing, one thing that um, I'm going to loop back to. Because we're pretty digressive, but that's the way the show goes. Is you asked me um, about teaching. Yeah. And so... Um, when I first started teaching college level, that was in 2002, I had to come up with my own curriculum. There weren't that many comics, college level comics classes at that point. Had you proposed it or were you hired to build it? I proposed it. Okay. Um, and I was hired by Cornish College of the Arts, where I'm still teaching now here in Seattle. Um, and I based a good chunk of the concepts on understanding comics. The Scott McCloud book? Yeah. yeah. Um, He's so much fun to record with, by the way. Oh, I'm sure. I was not He's expecting not. him to be as as just easy a conversationalist as he was. He is enthusiastic, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, uh, Which yeah. you're building off and, of that. And, and understanding comics, I just think, is it's such an important it's such an important text for anyone that wants to understand, to understand comics. comics. That's it. Yeah. Um, what happens between panels? Anyway, so years of taking comics apart and putting them together and having thoughtful, creative students um, come up with their you know questions and interpret things differently and kind of going over things that you know like uh, you know like elemental. Um, uh, ways of getting getting from one idea to another and structuring your stories and stuff like that. Um, I I felt like I had a lot of uh, a lot of very clearly identifiable tools, like lessons that I teach and worksheets that I came up with and stuff like that. When I was when I was doing marbles, I felt like I was using all of those things. It, it, it coming up coming up with new ways to do to do things because i was uh, a, a lot a lot of marbles was really new to me the kind of uh, the heaviness of the topic and the kind of dark humor then that i that i was everywhere and um just uh, just a just a lot more different um, angles and dynamics and moods to navigate mm -hmm. and, and, and make coherent. Um, so I felt like I was using everything that I knew uh, and all of the how-tos that I had done and were coming into play and the you know, ways to explain and use a lot of text but still make it visually interesting and and all of the different, you know, like ways of getting across a page, and and the different expressive styles of different, of different, the, the different the different ways that different styles are expressive, and um, 
I really felt like I was using, just using everything and mm-hmm. using everything I knew. And I remember one, a, a moment at my drawing table and thinking, maybe, maybe I'm using everything. Maybe I will have nothing, you know, at the end of this. Um, Instead of seeing how, it as something that I, would be how do generating more. I feel more? about that? Well, you know, like, it, Marvels was exhausting. Yeah. It, um, it, uh, it really felt like it was taking everything. Mm-hmm. And it also felt very important to me. And certainly once, once I was in it and had, you know, decided to do it, even just at that point, I knew that I had to do it and I had to do it to my fullest. Um, and so that point at my drawing board, I decided, you know, that, well, if this is all there is, then that's, then that's, that's so that's just got to be the way it the way that it is Mm -hmm. but that really felt that really felt like like i was using like if you like if you're in a room and you're and you're like you're like okay what else do i have i've gone through all of those boxes you know like wait maybe there's a box over there okay there is no box but here is a couple paper clips (laughs) you know like if i twist them together i don't know maybe you know i just felt like like i like i was using using everything so that was so that was one of the things that your I think your your question was what the process of doing marbles yeah. was like, and whether it was helpful to you. Whether it was helpful to me, well, it's been helpful to me in a in a zillion different well, ways. Well, yeah, in being successful, it's one thing, but in terms of was the process of telling that story something that gave you further insight into your condition? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, in a way that I helps. Mean, it, it's, um, but yeah, I mean, I wasn't, it, I wasn't intending to have it be, you know, therapy, but I kind of, I, you know, if you had told me then, you know, like, but I'm sure it's going to be very therapeutic, I, you know, like, I, you that, know, would, who, that wasn't who could argue with beginning. that, you know, like, yeah. yeah, well, sure. But, um, but it definitely, uh, it definitely, well, it, it, it forced me. I mean, that makes it sound like I was reluctant to do it, but I like going back and re-examining everything so thoroughly. And you have to be so thorough when you're doing comics. It's not just text, but you have to figure out how it looks. Yeah. You know, like, what did that feel like? What does that feeling look like? What, what words do I attach to that? How, how was I standing? Um, how was my doctor standing? How was my brother standing? What what look on my mother's face might she have had? And to really like get in there, like I'm the one that's drawing the eyes and the nose and the mouth. I mean, it's a, a very thorough exploration of a of a story, mm-hmm. really doing comics. So, or it can be, you know, like if you if, if you do you, it right, if you well, if you're in it in that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a story that uh, that if I if I were to. I guess I would say if so with marbles if if I if I had stopped short of giving it my all or stopped short of doing the best I could do I think it would have been more more how to put it more difficult maybe even more harm, harmful to me mm-hmm. to put out there because um Marbles was really my big coming out. I really was pretty private about having bipolar disorder. Um, so if you think about like how it's 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 not easy. So this it's it's sort of like my calling card. Like you know like yes I am bipolar here. Like here's this thing that I have done to explain to explain. And if this thing that I've done to explain is shoddy, you know, then I then well, that's, that's horrible. (laughs) Like if it's, if it's not something that I feel strengthens me, um, if I feel like it's something that weakens my case, say, then, um, it just wasn't going to feel, um, that it would make me feel more vulnerable, more vulnerable. And already I was feeling like that Hmm. was what I was risking was feeling vulnerable, exposing, exposing myself. So if you're going to do that, then it helps to know that you've done it the best you can. Like if you're in a talent show, let's say, and you're going to go up on stage and you're, 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 it's going to make you feel vulnerable. You're going to, you know, like be hoping that everybody else 
I, I don't know, maybe I don't need to go on with this, yeah. but you know, like you want to do the best you can. Yeah. Like if, like if everybody, if, if it doesn't go well, you know, I don't know, you want to be able to say that you, you know, you gave it your all and ideally, ideally giving it your all is, is enough that, that the, that the audience will be like, Oh, I get it. I get it. You know? Do you have a concern about being pigeonholed as the, oh, you're the bipolar cartoonist? Mm -hmm. Is that a, a... Well, that very specifically, actually, yeah. a good friend of mine, uh, when I was, I can't remember at what point, if it was when, uh, it was some, it was something like when I, after I turned in the final draft or when I was finishing it up somehow, she said, um, how, you might be the bipolar... How would you feel if you're the bipolar cartoonist? Yeah, the bipolar cartoonist. Right. Even though and we're pretty sure there are other ones. But, well, yeah. well, but, I mean... And, and, but not one who's made that right. the, the, the great work of their career. Well, and, and anyway. Sorry. So, that, but yeah. the, the answer was... Uh, I mean, I had to think about that for a moment. Um, and that, that's, that's all right. That's good. That's, you know, it's been a lot of work to get here. And I feel like uh, I feel like it's an important part of who I am, really. Uh, and certainly, there are more there are more um, celebrities and well-known people who are out now mm -hmm. about their mood disorders than there were when I was diagnosed in 1998. And I think that um it helps a lot to have to have um inspiration not yeah. role, I, you don't role say, models you don't want to say celebrity but, but but yeah celebrity well, in this case people, is okay that's, the people, that's, well yeah. somebody somebody who has a story that interests you and that you find strength from i yeah. mean for for whatever reason i mean it could be uh, your aunt you know it could be like some somebody if only everybody knew your aunt, you know, like, I yeah. don't know, a strong, a strong figure who has a story that you find inspiring. Mm. Um, I feel like I have a story that, that it, in that my story is in comics that excess, that is, Blah, blah, blah. It makes it more accessible to an audience that uh, com comics, I think, in general, make stories accessible to uh, a lot of people that wouldn't necessarily read the memoir of um, um, Robert Lowell, this you know very important poet. You know, yeah. like uh, I I know too. I've heard from a number of people that they read marbles when they were manic and they were having trouble focusing on anything and reading was really difficult. I th the, the, the text is big, there are a lot of pictures, there's a lot of space on the page um, and it's, I think the topic can bring people in. I know from my own experience of being manic, it's really hard to focus. So to be able to work in a medium that actually can be an appropriate tool for, you know, a, be a vehicle to, yeah. um, for somebody who's actually in that condition. You know, it's something that I didn't think of when I was putting it together, but it's, um, it, that's really important to me. I'm a huge believer in the power of comics yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, like learning new powers that it that it has you know reaching different people it it just speaks to that even more has there been an uh, i know there's been good audience response to it has there been a audience that's discovered you through marbles who's gone back and found your earlier work have you seen that that sort of crossover in terms of you know they love the book and they want to find out more about you or does the book kind of serve them what they need um well are you building an, a, a bigger audience beyond marbles i guess right um, that's right a weird question right well i think 
that's a little hard to say. It's a little hard to say. Um, I know that people who are familiar with my work, <laughs> have worked before I found marbles, but the, um, I, I have gotten a really significant reader response mm -hmm. from marbles and mostly what readers, um, uh, write to me about is marbles. Yeah. I just didn't know if you've, you've encountered anybody who, I read Marbles, and I went back and found your other work, and oh my God, it has nothing to do with... Right. Yeah. Some, some, but I, but I, I, that's not what I hear Yeah, about, it's more mostly. just the impact that it has on them mm -hmm. uh, in particular. Yeah, yeah. Which I assume is something that makes you feel really good. It's uh, intense. Yeah. Sometimes it's really intense. In the beginning, when Marbles had just come out, I, um, I was still really kind of vibrating with the 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 feeling you know like terrified and excited and i mean here is like i was out all of a sudden everybody knew i was bipolar people that i didn't know knew that i was bipolar uh so i so i still had that um when i had been talking about the book more for the previous year it it i realized um how much people were ready to talk about their own disorders like um well, so when I was working on marbles, um, I, like I've now said, I wasn't, I was still pretty private about my disorder. So when people would ask me what I was working on, I would say I was working on a graphic novel and they would say, Oh, what is, what's it about? And I would say, well, you know, I'm, it's still really in process. I'm not really talking about it yet. So it wasn't until, um, I was really quite late in the production and I realized, you know what, actually I have to start talking about this because otherwise it's going to be like, bam, you know, like the book is out and here I am on, sta on the spotlight. So, um, so I realized even when I didn't have a book in my hand, when I started saying, well, you know, I, I wrote this, I wrote this book about bipolar disorder. Actually, I had this whole line. I can, I can, it's, um, well, you know, like, oh, you know, like, what were you working on? A graphic novel? What's it about? It's, um, it's a graphic memoir, actually. It's called Marbles. Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me. It's about my bipolar disorder and what that's meant to me as an artist. And it brings in um, uh, artists and writers through history who had mood disorders and also a bunch of studies that correlate mood disorders and creativity I can't tell you how many times I have said that line. Yeah. It's an elevator <laughs> pitch. It, it's, it's, it's a good point. Well, it's because a couple of things. Um, it allows me, in saying the full name, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me, it sort of like couches what, this, what I mean by dis bipolar disorder. And then I come out saying, I am bipolar. And then I keep talking. And I give myself, because I've thought about this, like why it is that I say this line, Besides being an elevator pitch, which it is, too, you know, just like here's a description of what this thing is, is artists and writers through history who have had mood disorders, that gives me company, that gives me a context, that gives me a team, that yeah. gives me a group of people, and it's not just me. You know, I'm not, I'm not the crazy one. I'm not the only one up here on this stage. You know, like but broaden that spotlight. Look, there's a lot. And then um, studies um, correlating mood disorders and creativity and then bringing in like science and studies yeah. and something really concrete. And so, so basically, so what I was really doing with that statement was kind of just it's like broadening it and tightening it. Mm. Um, so, so that, so that was part, that was part of, um, going, going, going in, going into, I guess, like pub date, you know, when the, when the book was released, uh, um, I, I had learned though, in these conversations with people, like here, I would say my line, you are like, Oh, what's, what's it about? And like, Oh, here's my, here's my line, you know? And very often after that, people would, you know, like, Oh, wow, maybe we would talk about marbles for a moment. But, but then the person would say, um, I, I've actually been on, let's say Abilify for, um, a few years now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only working so good or, um, my mother was bipolar and she, um, uh, killed herself when I was 12. 
or my, um, I deal with anxiety or I deal with depression, but I don't take meds. I, um, row crew really hard every morning. And that seems to that be, good. but like over and over and over and almost everybody really, yeah. almost everybody because like I'm, I, cause I, I'm giving people an opening for that. And, um, and, and it, it's something that people don't really talk about m mental disorders and how, how close it is to pretty much everyone. You don't know, have to, you don't have to know very many people to know somebody with a mental disorder mm -hmm. and there are enough, uh, it, it, here again, like statistically, yeah. it's something like one in 10 have a mood disorder. And it's something, it's something much larger than that, obviously, that have some sort of mental illness at all or, or whoever have. So if you know anybody, yourself included, you probably know somebody who has or has had a, a mental illness of some sort. So it's not far under the surface for anyone and to give an opportunity to to talk about it or even or admit it or or air it maybe for the first time or to a stranger or I I I I I learned even before the book came out that people were really quite not just willing. I mean not not even what I was expecting was maybe they were willing to not see me as a weirdo and a freak, yeah. you know, that it was close enough to them that they but it didn't it, I didn't know how many people would, would bond would, to would you. Actually, would actually, yeah. yeah. And, and actually even, well, would it come out? Yeah, yeah, would, yeah. That, that's I what I mean, that they, they would actually offer their right. story right. at the same time. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I guess also there was a little, a little uh, again, like, no, I knew the statistics, you know, one in ten, but knowing the statistics actually doesn't really prepare you for the real life person in front of you. Yeah. Like just, just knowing the one in 10 people have a mood disorder, like, Oh, right. All of these people that I'm meeting have it in their lives so closely. You know, it's very different when it's actually in play in real life. So I already knew, I already knew that from these discussions that I'd had just about my book, just in the air, just verbally. Hmm. Um, and then once marbles came out, um, it, it wasn't a surprise so much then that so many people had, a the kind of personal response to it that, um, that they, that they did. I, I, yeah. I, I, and so at first, it, at first it was a little overwhelming and I wound up printing out a lot of the emails that I got uh, so that I had it kind of, uh, there was something concrete. Yeah. There was something, like a thing, like 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 all of this energy and all of these people who were like, oh my God, me too, or, or me too in whatever way, or now I understand this, or now my mother understands that, or now my patients understand, my doctor understands. Uh, and, um, it took a, it took a while to get, to get used to, but not, not as long as you might think it, it did, it did, it, it makes me, it makes me feel very purposeful. And you're working on a, we don't want to say sequel, but well, thematic say, sequel. Say sequel. Yeah. I've, I've started saying sequel. Okay. It's not a, it's not a sequel narratively, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't pick up where I left off. Because stability, and I've been stable for years now, uh, pretty much since I, I mean, stabilized in marbles, which was 2002. Um, that doesn't make for a very exciting story arc. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing stable. went wrong. But the, but yeah. the thing yeah. is uh, that, you know, once you stabilize, and it's a big challenge to stabilize, but then you have to do that. Treatment, meds, whatever it is, be careful, make sure you get enough sleep, keep a mood chart, 
you know, like for some people, you know, like go, go ahead and go to the hospital every once in a while, you know, like cycling to whatever degree for the rest of your life. I mean, it's a, it's a chronic yeah. disorder. It's, it's not, there is not a cure. So that part of the story isn't generally a part of the memoirs that you read. I mean, including my own up until the very last chapter where I basically say, you know, like stable is relative and here yeah. are all the different things that I do. But that, all the different things that I do, we don't really, you know, it's, 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 hard, it's hard to make that a good story. Mm -hmm. So that's my challenge for this one. It's a book of coping tools, basically. Um, uh, it's called Rock Steady. Ah, pun. Uh, verbs. <laughs> uh, um, verbs. Whatever. Rock, oh, rock, rock, oh. verb, and no. Uh, rock steady, brilliant advice from my bipolar life. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes through uh, dealing, dealing with getting enough sleep and meds and different kinds of treatments and recognizing your red flags and what to do about them and um, substances and feeling suicidal and financing your mental health and... Uh, uh, all that stuff, yeah. like a whole bunch, living with whole, it, living, living with it, living with it in a healthy way, which is not not easy. Mm. Yeah, but uh, but very doable. But it's it's really nice to know too that you have company. You know, mm. I understand. Last question. Mm -hmm. The book starts out with you getting this um, enormous back tattoo designed by one of my past pod guests, Kaz. Mm -hmm. If you could do it over, which isn't to criticize Kaz, but you could get one other cartoonist to design a great back tattoo for you, who would you use? I don't think this could be improved upon at all. Oh, yeah. I don't I mean, mean it I... improved. If Kaz never existed, you know, is there another cartoonist you would have said, you know, you should be my, my back tattoo designer? Um. And don't I, worry. It, again, not a right, slight right. on Kaz, who I, I well, adore. It would yeah. be. It would be. I, I'm. I am going to continue to hedge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's one of my. It's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my tattoo. My back tattoo from Kaz. It's gorgeous. It's, he. Uh, I don't. I. I don't. This probably didn't come up when you were talking. He. He told me that. Um, that he. Uh, he, I don't, I don't know if he, if he wanted this in my will or not, but that he gets, <laughs> if I die before him, that he gets my back skin. Uh, I think, yeah. he, I think he said to make a lamp. Yeah, well, duh. you'd, <laughs> like, you'd have like to at that point. The old days. Yeah, yeah. No, this whole this my back tattoo is so tied with um, asking him to do it, and and I think of. Um, being in his apartment in New York and with him and his wife, Linda, and, you know, like him tracing my back and, and, uh, it was, it was all kind of of a piece. So yeah. cool. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Ellen Forney. Thanks so much for coming on the virtual memories show. Thanks for asking me. And that was Ellen Forney. She's a fantastic cartoonist and an amazing person. Uh, and that Marbles book I mentioned is a, a really important piece of work. Um, her other books are a little more light, I, I guess. So if a bipolar memoir is a little too heavy for you, check out I Love Led Zeppelin, Lust, and Monkey Food, the collected edition of her I Was 7 and 75 strips. And if you're in Seattle, stop by that light rail station we talked about where her murals are on display. Uh, the pictures I've seen of them are awesome. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm a goddamn heel because I never got around to them during my visit. We left in a different direction to get back to, to my hotel. Never ended up in that neighborhood again. Never saw the murals in person. I've got to get back out there so I can see them. Anyway, you can check out all Ellen's work and her speaking gigs at ellenforney.com. And that's E L L E N. F O R N E Y dot com. And once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Ellen, so who are you reading? If you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the virtual memory show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. 
I just posted a new one with last quarter's guests, and it's it's dynamite. There's like a 10 minute section with Seth where we talk about um, how he how he fell in love with Anita Bruckner's novels, the guilt he feels over abandoning Alice Munro as his favorite novelist, and um, and what it's like to sort of do a deep dive into somebody who's published 20 to 25 books. And beyond that, there's a lot of other neat guests, really good conversation about the books in their lives. So um, you can get access to that one by supporting the Virtual Memory Show at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, the series of ebooks that someday I'm going to launch whenever the day job finally lets up a little bit, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this episode was part of a Seattle vacation that was pretty darn expensive, um, but it was a vacation and a pal's wedding, so it's not like I was traveling just to do the podcast. But still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, and equipment, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Stephan, Jack Les Carmella, Les Carmella, uh, he's a new one, I haven't heard the pronunciation of his name yet, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. You should check out facebook.com slash David and David Music to learn more about the reunion project he's working on with his great 80s band, David and David. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with the novelist Matt Ruff, whose most recent book, Lovecraft Country, is an absolute joy and will soon, well, it's in development to become a series on HBO. I say soon because I'm really hoping I'll get to see it. Till next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com for the few people who still use Tumblr, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. 